Well, hello and welcome to all of you. Um, welcome to this uh, 22nd anniversary of human design. I, uh, it's always an interesting week for me. Um, I have spent uh, most of my career over these 22 years um, being deeply involved in the logic that's revealed in the mechanics and um, in, in doing the work of, of, of laying out that information that is the bedrock of, of what it is the, that we have in human design, that is the science of differentiation. Um, I have never really spent um, a lot of my energy in um, dealing with the oddities of the beginnings of human design. When I began my career, um, the New Age was uh, peaking in terms of all kinds of things um, that were attractive to people. And um, though my own mystical process is something that has been profound and uh, for me just um, without words to describe it, um, it was never the point, at least from my perspective, and I think that I've made that clear over the years. The point has always been the knowledge itself, um, what human design is and what human design can do. As a matter of fact, I'm here 22 years later doing this um, because of, of you, in that sense, because of all of those beings that, in one way or another, were, were ready to see that this was something of value. Um, I know the what kind of an, of a process it is, a journey it is um, to introduce something that's new, and uh, every one of these anniversaries um, is always, in its own way, a surprise for me. That, that um, yeah, this journey has has gone as far as it's gone. Um, but as I uh, have often done on on these anniversary occasions, um, I, I have a chance to uh, to do the mystical side. As beautiful as human design is, as aesthetic as the mechanics of the Maya are, as it, for me anyway, and as extraordinary the tools that are inherent in the knowledge. Um, you know, for me, I know where all this began. Um, it, it began with the, I guess, the miraculous or the mad, uh, depends on one's perspective. Um, and there is no way, given the circumstances of my encounter, that um, I can ever be released from that. Um, in a sense everything since my encounter has been a kind of um, hmm. I was going to say a kind of deterioration but in a sense it is it's a kind of um, wearing down within the, the Maya itself to, to take this um, this experience which was so outside of um, what real seems to be and to have spent these 22 years uh, in, in grounding it as deeply into the Maya as one can. I mean, uh, the journey of human design is, uh, is a journey through the homogenized world and uh, it is a dense, dense Maya out there. I had a few moments this week where, um, in reflection, I, I suddenly, you know, grasped the distance for me between um, where I sit today and the world I inhabit right now, and um, where I was 22 years ago, and and I clearly remember where I was then. Um, and that was uh, a deeply alone and 
um, confusing transition to step out of the the density of the encounter. I mean, it was it was eight days and nights. Um, you know, the, there is um, a quality to it that you know when you lose it, when you you fall out of it. Um, you know you'll never have it again. Uh, you just know. My whole mystical process began with me suddenly being raw. Um, I mean, in, in that era when all of that began, um, which was in 1983, uh, I would introduce myself as Robert. Um, the raw just suddenly uh, came into existence when I, I landed on this island in the Mizzen. I, I didn't make um, any kind of mythical connection to it until I began going through various um, strange experiences that eventually led up to my encounter this connection to the sun. Um, interesting thing, the, the voice um, spent a great deal of time teaching me about the nature of the sun. I, I think if you go back into the the psycho history of humanity, um, you can only get to sun worshippers at some point. Probably for most of Homo sapiens' existence, in terms of percentage, we have been sun worshippers. It only made sense, after all. What was fascinating for me, and only later, um, I think that in the experience itself, only survival mattered. But the way in which I was given the cosmology, um, which is the way my process began, these trinities that we have spread out all over the place in the roots of so many religions, According to the cosmology that I was given, the, the sun is a, is a trinary crystal system. Um, this illustration basically shows you the way in which um, the primary design crystal shattered. And what you have here is that you have the center. And what you have over here is the camel. And what you have over here is the dog. So you're looking at these three elements that are at the core of the crystal in that sense. And are at the core of the fractal relationship of everything else to it. Um, within the context of this drawing, what you're looking at going around here, that is in the areas that are, co that are color coded, um, not the black areas, you're looking at the 16 faces. Um, you're looking at the way in which the quarters of quarters in the wheel itself um, are ruled by the personality processes. It is the consciousness field at work. Um, what I covered in detail in the quarter by quarter, the, the faces, the 16 faces of the Godhead, and um, what you may be familiar with by listening to, um, to Darmen's... Um, neutrino forecast because he references it. It is the way in which fundamentally um, the whole personality process is organized. And that the whole personality process is organized not simply within the domain of the planet itself but within the context of the solar system itself. So here when we're looking at this particular core we're looking at basically three elements. We can sort of think about them as personality crystals. Three elements that are in fact at the the core of the sun itself.
It's funny the way things work. Um, binaries are always fascinating uh, for me anyway because of my particular relationship to the sun I'll get back to that um, understanding the um, the relationship between the camel and the dog and ultimately, the relationship between the camel and the dog in the center is one of the mysteries of the way in which things work. First of all, to just give you a, a kind of brief idea, because this is not necessarily a, 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 a teaching class. The dog. I love these names, by the way. Um, I have no idea. Please understand that. I have absolutely no idea why they're called the dog and the camel. I really don't. Um, I can speculate, um, as you are all free to do so, but it's not something that I know, it's just something that was there with this knowledge. Um, first of all, the dog. If, if this was any other star in the sky, um, this is the only element that would be there. It is the same fundamental element that you find, particularly in the stars that are part of the general programming, stars like uh, you know, Sirius and Alcyone and uh, Dubé, and these, kinds of, these kinds of forces, that fundamentally what you're looking at is that there would be this, this kind of crystal at its core, the dog itself. And basically, what it does, in essence, is that it runs the, the sun in the same way that your design crystal runs your vehicle. And in the same way that your design crystal runs your vehicle and you breathe or you know, give off gas or however you want to look at it, that the way in which the dog runs the vehicle of the sun is that it gives off something that is very, very special to all of us. And that is, it gives off what in the mythology is called the string, that is, it gives the neutrino feed. I mean, 70 percent, just over 70 percent of the neutrinos that we receive, we receive directly from the sun. Those neutrinos, in essence, are produced out of the dog. This is its work. Its work in establishing the, the viability of the life of the sun. It's really something to think about very, very deeply. Um, so the, the dog in itself has a very basic, if I can put it that way, has a very basic role that is not an uncommon role. The only thing that makes it different is that it is hierarchically different. If you think about it, one of the things to understand, in, in, as you can graphically out of this, is that out of the way in which the fracturing, again, you're seeing this, you know, that it's done with perfect symmetry. That's not the way really to see it. But you have to sort of figure it in your imagination. If you're thinking about a crystal shattering, there are fractal lines that emerge, aspects that have boundaries with each other, that lead to boundaries with others, that lead to boundaries with others, and so forth and so on, and goes outward, because after all, we're dealing with numbers that are really quite spectacular in, in, in their zero content. So, both of them in that sense, because they are closest to the center, both of them have a great deal of influence, after all. And a great deal of influence also means that the way in which that influence, hmm, how shall I put this, um, actualizes, leads to um, dilemmas that can exist right down here on this particular plane. Let's think about the camel because the camel is um, it automatically makes you think about Egypt, doesn't it? The, um, the camel is, is one of those um, deep bazaaras uh, for me. What it does. Um, you know, you have the you have the sun, and you've got the dog, and beside that you have the center. But the camel moves. 
The camel's on the outside, if we can call it an outside. The camel moves. And its movement is something that is very, very specific. That is, it has an 88-day cycle, and it is a cycle that exactly matches the rotation, the orbit of Mercury around the Sun. It takes Mercury 88 days um, to go around the Sun. Uh, this is not exact, exact. It's 88 days point, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is that the movement of the camel is exactly synchronized to the movement of Mercury. Now, basically what that means is that no matter what neutrino information is being produced out of the dog, that the neutrino information that is going to impact humanity is going to be controlled by the camel and it's going to be exclusively expressed through Mercury. Um, when I was um, being given the knowledge, I was given many, many elements. Um, the synthesis that you see, that everyone has worked with in human design, there were other elements that um, were given to me that were never, um, I was never instructed to incorporate them. But I was given a way to see how um, they relate, as an example, um, the, the, the runes. Um, and I guess most interestingly, um, you could say it was from the tarot, but it really has nothing to do with it, but I think it gives you a <coughs> better way of grasping it, was something that was called sequencing. Um, you know, the, the the time that I, at least it feels this way in, in, in hindsight, the time I spent listening to what sequencing was, was enormous. Um, it was an elaborate story. And uh, the thing that's so remarkable about it is that from the moment that the personality crystal enters into um, the fetus, that is uh, 88 degrees of the sun, approximately 88 degrees of the sun before birth, uh, approximately 88 days, 88, 89 days. The moment that the personality crystal enters into the vehicle is the moment that it only accepts direct programming from Mercury. Now, it's really something to think about. That is, um, you know, every, every 88 days, there is a new programming sequence that is delivered to us through Mercury. Now, when I say that it's delivered through Mercury, obviously the way in which planets act as activations within the, the matrix of the body graph, you know, that the information is there, you know, for the holistic process. But again, to recognize that this is all about the way in which we are controlled at the personality level. And the instrument that controls us at the personality level is the camel. Now, let me go back a moment. There's three elements. Now, the center isn't always there. But regardless where the center is, the responsibility of the center is to program the whole. Now, the interesting thing about the center, which one would think is the most influential, is that it is blocked off in that sense by the camel in the way in which human beings specifically are programmed. Its job is everything else. So all the forms of life, for example, every other design that I was given, that the way in which the solar system itself operates, that all of that is the programming out of the center. But the direct programming of humanity is something that operates through the camel. Now, in the mythology that I was given, um, I was told that at the end of the round, and we're about 1,300 years from the end of the round, that at the end of the round, that 
these elements, the camel and the dog, incarnate. They incarnate once around. Um, the camel. Now this is something that I explored, particularly in the early years, because I, I had a lot of clients, at, at, particularly in Germany at that time, um, who were born in that era, between 1936 and 1941 and uh, some American students of mine who, who I met in those years. And I was always very curious about them, very curious about um, differences that I could note in, in the, their particular development. And there were, by the way. It's a, it's a very interesting study, anybody who ever wants to take a look at that. But basically what happened is that neither the camel nor the dog can, can incarnate as a human. As a matter of fact, um, the the dog can only incarnate it in, in very very low forms of life, uh, as low as an amoeba. As a, as a matter of fact, um, something that you know is is short. Um, but the camel is different. The the camel can take um, anything, a mammalian form, a reptilian form, or whatever the case may be. Um, it came into incarnation in in 1936. In other words, it left the sun in 1936 um, and, and stayed on Earth till 1941. Um, what that meant is that that was the only time in the entire round that the center got to program humanity directly. It's what makes these beings rather interesting. Rather than the coordinated programming of personality consciousness, that's the role of Neptune, uh, pardon me, the role of, of Mercury, uh, in its relationship to the camel. Here was the, the direct influence, the direct solar influence, if you will, um, on, on personality consciousness, on those that were born in that era. So, um, this is the one that's kind of scary. I, I, every time I speculate about this one, I, one really doesn't know what to expect. That is... Uh, it's like taking your design crystal out of your body. Um, what exactly is going to operate, if you know what I mean? Um, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's supposed to happen in 2084. Um, my assumption is that the, the longevity of that incarnation is probably going to be in seconds. And even so, I think it's going to disrupt the sun and it's going to disrupt the neutrino field. Um, so, you know, for those of you uh, somewhere down the road who ever get to listen to this, if you do, because uh, I won't be around in 2084, um, it's, it's something we'll have to wait and see about that. Um, that's the Rowena, by the way. That's the place where I, I lived um, when I had the experience. Actually, what you're looking through, this was originally the, the main door of, of the Rowena. And uh, here, though it's difficult to distinguish it in, in this particular you know, drawing, but basically what you're looking at is you're looking at a well house. Um, what you can't see is the opening of the well, which is over here. Okay? And there's um, a, a deep you know, cistern down here. Um, the cistern dried out about 300 years earlier. Um, it's why this house was left to go to ruin. Uh, no water, no way to be able to work the land. Um, as far as I understand, the, the design crystal um, bundle came into this, what was deep underground, this, this cistern deep under here. Um, in fact, inside here is not a courtyard. It was actually the main room, but it, it was open to the sky. It was only at the very back of this building um, that there was a single room that had been put back together again. And, and that was the room um, where I spent, um, with the exception of one evening where I came out to this inner courtyard, um, I spent all the time inside of that, um, inside of that Rowena. It's funny about fear. Um, I'm an integration ego manifester, so I, I guess, uh, and designed for shock with my son in 515. Um, 
I, I don't think I had a moment to really be afraid um, in the experience. Uh, I think if I had had a chance to grasp what was happening to me, I guess I would have been very frightened. Um, it was more like, um, you know, I, I, I was just being held in a, in a thrall and uh, I was just holding on. What scared me was the end of it all. Um, I, I guess it was about uh, somewhere between 11 and 12, somewhere around midday. Um, and um, the sun is high early then. Uh, it was winter. Um, and uh, the voice told me to go up the the mountain, actually in this, this direction here, um, there's a hilltop about uh, 200 meters up above where I was. Um, altogether rather high for the island, about 400 meters altogether because the arena was on high ground. Um, and and um, it told me to go up onto the... It was a very difficult walk, I remember that. Um, uh, I had not eaten or, or had anything to drink or, or, or slept um, for those eight days. So I was in quite a state. And uh, my body had a kind of um, odd sheath to it, sort of like when your foot's asleep. Um, so it was an interesting process trying to find my balance trudging up this hill. And when I got to the top of the hill, I, I sat down and the voice started to um, repeat something to me. Um, I, I guess you would call it um, a mantra. Um, it had maybe, um, I've never counted them, but I would guess no more than uh, two dozen syllables to it. Um, and I was told to, to repeat it and open up my eyes and look at the sun. It's funny about fear. I mean, I'd been eight days on the other side of the sky and everything was okay, you know. And uh, this opening up your eyes to the sun, I, I think all of us from the time that we're, we're tiny, you know, this is one of those those great warnings, you know, every time there's a, an eclipse, you know, all of these talking heads warning you about going blind and all that stuff. And I certainly didn't want to go blind. And um, as crazy as everything was, I, I'm no madman. Um, I've stayed sane through all kinds of bizarre. And um, yeah, so I had this rush this adrenaline rush, I guess, just the fear rush. And, um, yeah, I opened up my eyes to um, the midday sun in Ibiza. And don't be fooled by it being uh, winter. Um, we're far south, and the sun is always hot. The air sometimes is cool, but the sun... I, it was an incredible shock. Um, you know, the first thing you get to see is uh, the blue angel. It's a, it's a funny dancing blue thing. I don't know what it is. Um, I, w I was paying more attention to my esophagus. You know, if you ever have the experience that you take a a real shot of whiskey, you know, that burn in your throat. Um, I had a burn in my throat and it was going all the way down the, the middle of my body. I've never felt anything like that. Um, hotter than when you swallow a hot piece of food, you know, that, that pain that goes through with the heat. And uh, when it hit my stomach, I had a flood of nausea. Uh, and by the way, my eyes are still open. 
um, I can feel the, the tears um, washing my eyes and uh, the heat pouring through my body, just pouring through my body. I sat there a long time. Um, when I stopped, it was all over. I remember treading down the hill and being absolutely astonished to see my dog Barley, who I was convinced was dead. I mean, he hadn't moved in eight days. I assumed he was dead. Um, I was dazed. I was weak. I don't really remember how I spent the day. But I do remember that uh, going to sleep and waking up was something that was unbelievably fast. And um, I remember going outside. I was very cold. And the sun was up. And I just opened up my eyes to the sun. Um, I would do that for nearly two years, every day. Sometimes while I was running, I still see pretty good, by the way, though I do not recommend this. The voice said that um, I had a relationship to the dog. Um, I have no idea what it was for. I have no idea what value it brought into my own process. Um, I obviously don't do it anymore, though every once in a while, I must say, I, I do take a peek. Um, I just always assumed that the serendipity of being called raw had um, some kind of intrinsic merit. Anyway, that's my mystical story for you. Um, but it is the 22nd anniversary, and uh, I am certainly open to uh, whatever, comments, questions, uh, you name it. Would you make any connection between the, uh, the camel and the Second World War? I mean, there's something logical in that, Philip. Uh, you know, um, it's not something that that I was told. Um, the thing is that who it really affected were all of those beings that were were incarnating. And so, you know, these are children, and um, you know, even the ones born in '36, by the end of the war, they were nine years old. Um, so I don't really think it has a direct connection, though I think it's obvious that whoever these children are and wherever they were born, they were certainly born under the duress and tension of the homogenized world in one of its, you know, one of its orgies of, of savageness. So certainly there was an impact on their psyche from all that. Hey, don't be shy. It's a party. Who is the voice? Um... It's the design crystal bundle. Um, you know, this is, uh, as far as I understand, um, this is what it is. It's what makes a human design in that sense, or at least the way it was delivered, unusual. Um, most revelation is, not most, all revelation has been personality revelation. Um, the human design, all design is form principle. It's not an entity at all. It, it is the the design crystal bundle that is at the center of the earth, just as we have crystal bundles, personality crystal bundles around the earth. It's the yin-yang of the consciousness potential of the crystal field. All I was doing was that I was in... Everybody got seeded in 1987. Everybody got seeded. I mean, it's the neutrinos going through the design crystal bundle. I was just the closest to it. Um, I mean... Um, the proximity created quite a phenomena, but in fact, it was one of the first things that I realized 
that I, you know, when I began my journey of trying to introduce this knowledge, that it was clear that, you know, everybody in some way or another got seated with this. Hello, it's Dina. I don't know, maybe it's my illusion or hypnosis, but it seems for me, as far as I, I noted, uh, people who was born between 36 and 41, they are really different from all others. Ra, uh, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, one of my favorites was Ed Stanton. Uh, many of you might remember Ed. Um, he and I looked at that a lot. That was a generation that had Pluto in the 56th gate um, as part of that. So there were some very interesting things about the fact that that generation was the beat generation. They laid the foundation for the Cultural Revolution of the 60s. Remember, they weren't specifically programmed by Mercury. This was a a much broader scope, and I think it laid the foundation for the new age, for looking beyond. It laid the foundation for advanced physics. Um, you know, I think it's a, it, it's a very significant generation. I'm uh, wondering if I'm the only one here who fits into that um, period of, you said, 1936 to 1941. If there are others, I'm curious. And I'm wondering if they'd like to identify. Yeah, that's true, Kiara. You are one of those, aren't you? <coughs> it's um, and good for you uh, that you're still here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, one of these days there'll be somebody that really wants to investigate that. Um, that would be uh, delicious because. Uh, it, you know, there's uh, there's time involved in all of this, um, and to keep, um, you know, what their contribution is as a general map, because I think what you'll see is that they were always the the generation that was ahead of their time, um, and um, I've known some of these beings personally here in the island, um, people who first opened up the you know, an alternative way of life here, people who did that in the 50s and uh, came out of that generation. And uh, y you can really see how, how much they contributed to, you know, the what the 60s were going to be. Yeah, Jürgen was one of them. It's interesting because I was uh, friends with both of those guys, guys Ed and Jürgen, <laughs> and uh, we would have some of the most far out weirdest, interesting conversation. Um, it was really fun. Yes, yes. Would have been nice to be a fly on the wall. I'm sure it was. Yeah, um, I remember you saying at one time that there was a special relationship between the 4323, the 2838, and the 3955. And I, I wondered if you could kind of elaborate on that. What was you know, what was the real connective thing with that? What do they do for each other, or why is that a, a special, a, apart from the fact that they're very individual? Deafness. Deafness. You know, one of the, one of the great dilemmas of individuality is how sensitive they are to acoustics. The very sensitivity to acoustics op opens them up to the possibility of mutation. Yet at the same time, the sensitivity to acoustics also means that there's all kinds of stuff around them, and how do they filter it? The way they filter it is that they're fundamentally deaf. Um, if you've got a 2838 and they're in struggle mode, you're not going to be able to tell them anything. Um, you know, if you've got a, a 5539 and they're one, into one of their mood trips, you're not going to be able to tell them anything. If you've got a 4323 telling you that they know something and you're telling them that, that they don't, they're not going to be listening to you. Um, so on one side it can be um, irritating to others, um, but it's the way in which the purity of the individual process is maintained without deafness, uh, without the ability to be able to filter out the you know, the noise, in that sense, is the only way that individuality can, can maintain its purity. Yeah. Also, I remember you saying something about integration, you know, that integration really isn't here and, and, and participate in mutation. You know, that the individual uh, circuit is about mutation, but the, the integration circuit uh, doesn't mutate. Uh, I wonder if you could kind of elaborate on that. 
Well, it doesn't mutate in, in the basic sense that it is the most primitive um, and in that way can be deeply stuck in its own survival. I mean, I mean it saved my life. I mean, I'm integration. So, you know, I, I'm deeply aware of, of without it, I, I, you know, there is no way that I would have survived. So it's very primitive in that sense. But, you know, integration is always waiting for, you know, uh, the initiation. And uh, it is one of the things that, you know, is the only way in that sense. Uh, it's like with the 2838. The 2838 can bring the mutative process immediately into integration because it opens it up to the possibility of not, funny enough, being deaf to the other. I mean... Uh, you know those those particular those particular uh, awareness channels. Um, they carry with them the you know the the deepest the deepest demands that are there for the individual. That is uh, to find their spirit and their purpose. You know through knowing and um, and it has to be their own knowing. So they they have their power. I have questions for you. Um, could you make for me some clearness about one thing? Several years ago in Ibiza on the seminar about uh, demons, angels, hosts and so on, you said that you got uh, uh, education process from the fifth color. But uh, at the same time we know that you got uh, information from the bundle of uh, crystal of design. So uh, <laughs> could you comment this? I don't know where you found that. It's always been the same. It's always been described in exactly the same way. Always. Always. Um, Christian. It's an interesting point, Christian. Uh, and it's clear to me that one of the main themes that I was given and something that I've talked about a lot is that I, I was given knowledge for the future, for children. Uh, it's still something that I talk about a lot because, of course, uh, you know, if you look at the way in which a nine-centered being is supposed to develop in their lives, um, those of us who began our lives as uh, homogenized beings, um, you know, our opportunities to fulfill the, the full potential of what we're here for is limited. There's no question about it. So, you know, those beings born after 1987 um, you know, I think that there are the ones that, um, you know, naturally are, are ready to receive the information that can come to them. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not messianic, never have been. It is, I'm, I'm a deeply hierarchical being in, in my understanding of the nature of the Maya. Um, it is clear to me that on this plane, 4% to 4%, um, is basically where the possibility is of, uh, you know, those human beings that um, have a way in which they can um, step out of the embrace of the program and, and find their way. Um, it's very limited. So there are many other factors other than simply being born post-1987. Um, I do think that what it does bring is that Certainly, as a date, and that goes along with, uh, you know, the the supernova 1987A, um, the harmonic convergence of of the Mayans. Um, 1987 it was a platform year, and uh, you know, it 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 was sort of the clarion uh, announcing that uh, there's something new going on. Why four percent? The Basically, the relationship of atomics to dark, dark energy and matter. Um, we are always under the perceptual assumption that um, atomics is the nature of the universe uh, because that's what we see and what we relate to. Um, but in fact, atomics, which is where the mutative engine of cognition is, is, is uh, a mere 4%. So um, it is basically... Um, yeah, it's it, it's basically a way of looking at a formula, you know, and it's to, it, because it all works like that, the, the above and below and such. Um, I've always calculated it somewhere between 35 and 50 million people at any given time, 
uh, given our population of over 7 billion, um, you know, that that's really where the possibility is. Uh, most of the world doesn't have access to uh, the knowledge. Uh, most of the world has enough trouble surviving. Half of our planet doesn't get enough calories a day. Um, we, you know, this world is filled with uh, <coughs> violence and suffering and all kinds of stuff. Um, even those that are gifted enough or, or unusual enough or bizarre enough to be able to step out um, in some societies, the punishment for that is not, not something that anybody wants to think about. And why the four of the four? Because I've seen it. Um, you know, um, I used to do, um, oh, I did so many of them for a very long time, public lectures, introductory lectures. And, uh, you know, it's the 4% that, that gets to show up, but it's the 4% of the 4% that goes a step further. Um, and, you know, you, you, you are, um, as a homogenized being, you are drawn to things for all kinds of different reasons that have very little to do with what's going on. And uh, whether or not you go beyond that is something else. <laughs> Bindu. Yeah. Um, let's put it this way. I, I, I could answer that question. Um, but you know, it would be not something that I would want to have recorded then kept for posterity. I'm very careful about what what anything is claimed in, in, in my name. I do know that um, in a very technical sense it is indeed my, my dog, but then again, you know, what to say of all of that. Uh, you know, when I started my process, I wondered, what, what are people going to say when you tell them, you know, a voice told you how everything works? I mean, it's really mad. It's really mad. All of it's mad. The only thing that has saved me is the 22 years that I've worked at the science of human design. Because it's remarkable what it does for a human being. It's remarkable what it reveals. But, you know, the guy that lived in that building over there, oh, that's, that's a totally different piece of business. It really is. The other thing to grasp about this knowledge and about incarnative evolution. It is hierarchical. Human design's always been elitist. Uh, you know, some people hate words like that. But I mean that in, in, in um, a fractal sense only. Um, it isn't for everybody. I mean, it could be, you know, but it isn't. I mean, uh, it never is going to be for everybody. Um, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, the beauty of understanding the mechanics, I'm a practical 5-1. You know, you understand the mechanics and you just see the movie. The movie for us as human beings anyway is, you know, we're, we're not even interesting to the general program anymore. We're not. We're not. The program is pushing towards mutation. It's pushing towards the rave. It's pushing towards the end of the cycle. You know, we're an afterthought in this process. It's why we have this perfect opportunity, the beauty of that, you know, to see. And, of course, whether or not it's for you to see, um, you know, this is one of the great mysteries that you have to carry within yourself. Um... You know, I, I look upon it always in the same way that I look upon my own process as one of great good fortune. Um, I'm grateful every day of my life for uh, such an adventure. And um, that adventure is an adventure with truth. I spent a long time doubting such a thing existed. At least the, the relative truth that one can rely on. A truth that you know, one can measure oneself. Um, that's, that's a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, I'm a mystic. Uh, I, I didn't start out to be a mystic. Uh, it, it was never something that was interesting to me. Um, I had it imposed on me. And, 
at the same time, there's one side of me that's the mystic and the other side of me that's a very, very rational, um, practical man. And uh, I look at the knowledge and I think, yes, wonderful mechanics. Um, and I'm grateful for everybody who shows up at the door. Um, I'm pleased for them that um, it's their serendipity to be there. What you do with it, I don't know. Um, and being an integration being who's unemotional, I'm blessed with not really having to care. So I don't have to suffer for all those who get to the door and don't go any further. The beauty of this is that there's no promise in what I was given. There's just the beauty, the exquisite beauty of knowledge. Um, I guess the thing in the end that makes the knowledge so elitist is that you do have to have two strikes against you. You've got to be slightly odd and you have to be slightly intelligent, you know. If you don't have that combination of being, well, different and intelligent, you don't get past the door. You know, the knowledge is what saves the personality from destroying life. The design is easy to deal with, you know, strategy and authority, you can teach a monkey, you know, but the mind, you know, this, this is healed through knowledge, through truth, through personal, personal revelation. And then the joy of uh, what it's like to be here. It's a hell of a movie. And uh, yeah, I hope you, uh, you all get to that place. Anyway, um, thank you for being here. Um, I do appreciate it. Um, it's, it's nice to uh, enter into our 23rd year. And uh, thank all of you for your work in human design. And uh, yeah, let's see what happens. All of you, you take care. Remember, in these times, and in our generation, we have never seen anything like what's going on right now. You trust in your strategy and authority. It'll carry you through, I tell you that. Anyway, bye for now.